Hi everyone, welcome to the first lecture of Module 11 of Useful Genetics, where we're going to talk about what I think is the most exciting problem in all of biology, the origin of life. We'll approach this problem, at first unsuccessfully, from three different directions. Backwards from the information that we have about what the organisms that are alive today, forward from what we know about the origin of the universe and of our planet, and sort of sideways from the definition of life. All of these approaches are going to leave a gap between the simple chemicals that were produced, that we know were produced on our planet, and what we can infer about the properties of the first living organisms. Fortunately, that gap has been bridged now, and it's been bridged by molecular biology by a kind of molecule called catalytic RNA, which makes possible a new kind of early sort of life form on the planet, the RNA world. Now, first let's think backwards from the life that we know today. Here's the modern tree of life, and we know that all the organisms that are alive today descended from a, from a single common ancestor that's indicated by this point on the schematic diagram. And we call that, an that ancestor LUCA, which stands for Last Universal Common Ancestor. There were many common ancestors. Ancestors after this aren't universal, they're only the ancestors of part of the tree. Ancestors before this aren't last. This point marks the time when the last organism existed that was an ancestor of everything that's alive now. We know quite a lot about the properties of this organism by looking at properties of modern organisms. We know that we all share a DNA de genome and almost certainly we inherited that from the last ancestor. All modern organisms are cellular with a lipid bilayer membrane. All modern organisms carry out protein synthesis. Um, so LUCA must also have had ribosomal RNA-based protein synthesis machinery that used instructions for messenger RNA and adapters of transfer RNA and the standard genetic code. We know that LUCA used catalysis by proteins, and we know there must have been many, many cat catalytic proteins because of the many modern biochemical pathways that are shared by all modern organisms and must have been present in glucose. But this doesn't really get us to an answer. This organism, LUCA, is much too complicated to be the very first living thing. So let's try thinking in the other direction from the origin of the universe. Well, we had the Big Bang, we had lots of reactions in space and on Earth, and we wound up with a planet with oceans that contain substantial amounts of many complex organic molecules. Some of these molecules formed on Earth, some were brought to Earth by comets where they had formed in space. They're complicated, but they're complicated in very random and messy ways. And there's certainly nothing that we know of that would ever earn the, the description of being alive. So we still have our problem. We have to bridge the gap between what we know about the last universal common ancestor and what we know about the molecules that were present on early Earth. Big, big gap. Maybe it will help to think about what we mean by the word life. If we knew what we're trying to explain the origin of, surely that will make the problem easier. Well, in fact, <clears throat> in fact, it doesn't. And that's because the definition of life, like the definition of almost every other important concept, falls apart when we push it to a situation where it really matters that we know exactly what it means. All of these definitions of life are very nice as long as you don't really care about getting it right, but they don't apply to deciding what's alive at the origin of life. So I'm an evolutionary biologist and a molecular biologist, and so I'm going to take an evolutionary molecular approach to this question. Instead of thinking what's the definition of life, let's think of what 
are the essential properties that living system, any system would have to have before we would consider that maybe it ought to be called live. And the first is that that system must be able to reproduce. The entities, these living things, must be able to reproduce. And they must have some form of heredity so that the offspring are like their parents. Now, in principle, it could be the case that the offspring were always exactly identical to their parents. That wouldn't solve our problem of the origin of life. But, well, sort of fortunately for us, in fact, offspring are never exactly like their parents, even in clonally reproducing organisms. There's quite a lot of variation. Some of that variation is due to chance or environmental factors, but some of it is heritable. And this is all it takes to, in principle, solve the problem of the origin of life, or at least to simplify it a great deal. And that's because if an entity has reproduction, heredity, and that reproduction involves heritable variation, where variants are generated and then those variant properties are are inherited by subsequent generations and they affect survival or reproduction, as they certainly will, then we have all of the conditions we need for natural selection to act. Natural selection is an inevitable, unavoidable consequence of any system that has these properties. And conceptually, that solves the problem of the origin of life in it, because it changes it to the question of when did natural selection begin? If we can get a situation where something could have arisen by chance from the organic molecules on the early Earth, but was complicated enough that natural selection would act on it, we've basically solved the problem. Because once natural selection can act, the ability to reproduce the process of heredity will be refined, and we will get increasingly sophisticated organisms that we would all agree were alive. Now, the problem is, of course, that LUCA is much too complex to have arisen by chance. And the organic molecules don't have replication or heredity or heritable variation. We can make the problem a little simpler by looking at some aspects of the biochemistry and metabolism of modern organisms. And what they suggest to us is that there existed earlier ancestors before LUCA in which there was no DNA, in which the hereditary material was RNA and other processes still similarly dependent on protein. So although this is still much too complex to have arisen by chance, it gives us some insights into what kind of molecules we should be thinking about. Here's the kind of world that we're thinking of, and it's often called the RNA plus protein world. And that's in contrast with the RNA world that I'm going to describe in a minute. In this early form of life, which may or may not have been cellular, Heredity was carried, hereditary information was carried by RNAs, which were replicated and passed on to subsequent generations. This replication was catalyzed by proteins, as were the other processes in these reproducing entities, which may have been cells or may not. So that these, this simpler world had metabolism carried out by proteins, it had hereditary variation, mutations happening in the RNA genomes, just as we see in viruses with RNA genomes today. And so it had all the properties needed for natural selection, could easily evolve into DNA-based forms. However, it's still too complicated to have arisen by chance. And the reason is that there's a fundamental paradox in protein synthesis. So protein synthesis, production of proteins, requires not just the RNA in the ribosomes, but it requires the proteins in the ribosome. So ribosomes 
are partly RNA machines, but they're also protein machines. You take away the protein, the ribosome can't synthesize anything. So protein synthesis requires ribosomes. But for ribosomes to function, you have to already have a way to make proteins. So then we get into this silly paradox. How could ribosomal proteins evolve before there were ribosomes to make them? And how could ribosomes evolve before there was a way to make the proteins of the ribosomes? This paradox was resolved by a molecular biology breakthrough in the early 1980s. And that was the discovery that RNA molecules can be catalytic in the same way that proteins can be catalytic. So this made possible what's referred to as the RNA world. Um, the hypothesis that earlier in evolution, before the RNA plus protein world, there existed an RNA world where the replicating entities, the things we might consider to be alive, had RNA genomes, but those RNA genomes weren't replicated by proteins. They were replicated by RNA. And this, these organisms, these proto-organisms, had perhaps rather limited catalytic capacities, but the catalysis that happened happened by RNAs, catalytic RNAs. And we're confident that RNAs, at least in principle, can do this because RNA molecules have many of the same properties that enable proteins to carry out catalysis. They can fold up, they have reactive groups, and it's been demonstrated now that RNAs can carry out many different kinds of catalysis. So although this is still a hypothesis, it's a very plausible hypothesis. So what we've done is we've said that natural selection could have begun with a very, very primitive RNA world, initially perhaps just with simple self-replicating RNA molecules or RNA-like molecules. They probably wouldn't have been exactly the RNAs we'd recognize today. RNA-like molecules that took advantage of the wealth of um, chemicals that were present on the early Earth. And that because these were now something that natural selection could act on, they were able to evolve first into a more complex RNA world, then into the RNA plus protein world, because the primitive RNA catal catalysis machinery could, in principle, synthesize the proteins that are needed for the first RNA protein world before the full, fully fledged ribosomes were formed, and then into the last universal common ancestor. So we first considered the last universal common ancestor and the properties of the early Earth. We've talked about how thinking about molecular biology and evolutionary biology originally clarified but didn't resolve the paradox by pointing out that the real problem was how do you get functioning protein synthesis machinery that, that needs proteins before you have any proteins. And then we talked about how the discovery of catalytic RNAs, RNAs that act as enzymes, resolved the paradox. And we described the RNA world that we now hypothesize was the first living entities, the first entities that were subject to natural selection and thus capable of evolution to become more complex and more sophisticated. Coming up next, we've got two lectures on mitochondrial genetics. I hope to see you there.